I am going to call to order the appointments and ordinances meeting <clears throat> located at Greenfield City Hall meeting room two. Um, I'm going to make a correction to the notes. The Our notice of meeting had the date as Wednesday, September 9th, um, even though it was on the calendar for Wednesday, September 13th when it was posted. So we're meeting on Wednesday, September 13th, uh, 2023 at 5.30 p.m. Um, call to order. Councillor Healy. <clears throat> He is absent. Counsel, Counselor Golub? Here. Counselor Ricketts? Present. And Counselor <clears throat> Gilmore is absent at the moment, but will hopefully be joining us. Right, she's running late. Um, I'm going to read the statement. This meeting is being recorded by the Appointments and Ordinances Committee. If any other persons present are doing the same, you must notify the chairperson at this time. In accordance with MGL C 30 ASS 20 G, no person shall address a meeting of a public body without permission of the chair and all persons shall, at the request of the chair, be silent. No person shall disrupt the proceedings of a meeting of a public body. If after clear warning from the chair, a person continues to disrupt the proceedings, the chair may order <clears throat> And to withdraw from the meeting. And if the person does not withdraw, the chair may authorize a constable or other officer to remove the person from the meeting. Um, oops, sorry, I did roll call before I did the call to order. Well, we did we did that out of order. Um, two things I want to make note of. One is that at this time, if we lose internet access, um, we have you, we have to adjourn the meeting because we need three in attendance. Um, I apologize for not being there. I'm sick and contagious and didn't want to expose anybody to that. Um, in, unless Councillor Gilmer joins us, then we'll have an extra person. So just of note, if we lose internet, you guys need to adjourn. Um, and I will uh, take public comment um, right after we accept the minutes. Um, I'll take public comment from, from then. Um, can I get a motion to accept our minutes from August 9th, 2023? So moved, Ricketts. Second. Thank you. We have no public hearings tonight. And so I'm happy to take public comment. I will give everybody um, up to three minutes and I will set a timer here. And so my apologies if I interrupt you when you hit your three minutes. Um, is there, I think maybe we'll, we can start if people online want to speak, can you put your name and address <clears throat> in the chat? Uh, and then for uh, people in person, if you just want to go from like left to right in the room or whatever. I didn't, I obviously am not there to put out a sign up sheet. So my apologies. We have Joan, Mitch, and Al, if you're okay with that, in that order. That sounds great. Joan, if you want to start that, that would be wonderful. Yes. Okay. Members of the Ordinances Committee, my name is Jo Marie Jackson. I live on Highland Avenue. On July 19th, I testified before the City Council that Greenfield should adopt home equity reform amendments in light of the May 25th U.S. Supreme Court decision in the Tyler case that declared home equity taking beyond property taxes due plus court costs was unconstitutional robbing property owners of their just compensation for their land and home. The first home equity reform amendment on your agenda says, quote, the Greenfield City Council amends the code of the city of Greenfield by adding chapter 279, home equity ordinance, article one, provision of restitution as followed, based upon the property auction records of the tax collector. 
the city shall make reasonable efforts to, con to contact all property owners who fall within the statute of limitations and who were subject to unconstitutional surplus equity taking to offer said property owners compensation for any excess equity taken plus interest calculated from the date of taking by the city up to the date of final restitution, unquote. A little over a week ago, the State Department of Revenue told the municipalities that it would, quote unquote, not object to a community temporarily holding any surplus home equity in an agency account until there is a directive from the courts on this matter. The DOR warned that as a result of the Supreme Court decisions, there is uncertainty as to whether or not the tax title foreclosure surplus proceeds will need to be returned in all cases to property owners. As you will hear from Al Norman later, the property owners who have already had their home equity stolen illegally from them are not going to wait for a directive from the state courts on this matter. These victims of home equity theft have waited years for their just compensation. We want Greenfield to admit its actions have been declared by the Supreme Court to be unconstitutional and to show there is a path for restitution for these victims. We want to avoid unnecessary legal costs by litigation brought in the federal court by property owners who have been harmed by the city action. These city taxpayers should not have lost any home equity beyond what they owed and now we owe it to them to pay them back for money plus interest for the money we should have never taken from them. This is stolen money. It is our moral and legal responsibility to pay back those we have harmed. I hope you will do the right thing for these people and send this to the city council with your unanimous approval. Thank you. I am attaching the recent DOR bulletin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mitchell State is next. <laughs> Members of the Ordinance Committee, my name is Mitch Speed. I live on Highland Avenue. The second home equity reform amendment before you tonight deals with how the proceeds of a public auction of a house, which has been taken for back taxes, is dispersed going forward. Last November 16th, this Greenfield City Council unanimously voted to send a resolution to the Massachusetts General Court urging adoption of legislation relative to tax deeds, amending Section 53 of Chapter 60. So that after a public auction, a foreclosed property for distribution of proceeds would go first to the tax title holder, the city. And the property owner would receive any surplus equity in excess of what was owed. And after giving the city all collection costs, it expended. We thank you for, your, for supporting that resolution to the general court. Five months later, on April 12th, we urge the city council to use the provision of chapter 60, section 87 of the mass general laws to adopt a local ordinance in the Greenfield, in Greenfield directing the tax collector pursuant to the language found in chapter 60, section 87, to stop using the power of taking, but instead the use of power of sale process, which is used by banks when dealing with foreclosed properties. You, the city council, have the power to pass this ordinance now, and we urge you to do so as soon as you can. On May 25th, 2023, the United States Supreme Court in the case Tyler versus Hennepin County ruled that the county had the power to sell a 94-year-old woman's home to recover the unpaid property taxes, but it could not use the toehold toe of the tax debt to confiscate more than what was due. The second ordinance now before you ensures that Greenfield will no longer take surplus home equity as part of any public auction of property due to delinquent taxes. This ordinance does not prevent the city from taking property for unpaid taxes, 
It just says that the city, like a bank, will not take anything beyond back taxes, interest, and collection costs. Pursuant to MGL 60, Section 87, the city directs the collector of taxes to use the power of sale to enforce a lien for taxes, not exercise the power of taking under Chapter 60, Section 53. Pursuant to the provisions of MGL 183, Section 21 and 27, one, after an order of public sale of a foreclosed property, the distribution of proceeds shall treat the tax title holder, the city, like a mortgagee, with the first priority interest in the proceeds from the property, and treating the delinquent debtor, the property owner, as a mortgager, rendering the surplus, if any, to the mortgager. This ordinance means that going forward, no other property owner in our city will lose home equity that belongs to them. And the city will not overreach by taking more than what it's owed. The city of Greenfield should not be in the business of unhousing our citizens who are struggling to pay their property taxes. Now that the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that property owners who lose their home that auction should receive just compensation. For their taking, we must change our ordinance to prevent this from ever happening again to any property owner. I urge you now, I urge you to end this process now and show other cities and towns in the Commonwealth how to stop home equity debt. Thank you. Many re uh, members, for the record, my name is Alan Norman of uh, Grinnell Street. Uh, the mayor of Greenfield stated recently that the city had, quote, no legal path, unquote, for correcting the unconstitutional taking of excess home equity. As you have heard, the State Department of Revenue has warned municipalities that excess home equity they took may have to be returned. I can assure you the people who lost home equity are not going to wait for the state to decide when homeowners should be reimbursed. They are going to become plaintiffs. I am expecting soon to see litigation begin in a number of cities and towns across the state, including Greenfield. I'll have some comments at the end about the suit that was filed this morning, which I sent you all. Based on a public records request that I made some months ago to the city tax collector, Greenfield had roughly six properties in 2020 and 2021 that were taken for back taxes. Several of those takings were small dollar amounts, under $10,000, but there were two that were over $50,000 and one that was very large in the range of $270,000. It's my understanding that these kinds of cases are likely to become lawsuits against the city of Greenfield and result in unnecessary legal expenses for the city. I hope that any such filings can be settled quickly by the city. The first ordinance you are reviewing this evening deals with full restitution. The legal path to resolve these cases may have to be through the courts. But if the city acknowledges that such takings should lead to restitution, then our mayor may have the legal path needed to make people whole. The second amendment regarding future property auctions should be very straightforward for the ordinances committee to pass since the full council has petitioned our state lawmakers to pass legislation at the state level to do this. But if we instruct our tax collector to use the power of sale process, that will end the unconstitutional taking of home equity in Greenfield. We should reach the point where a tax collector considers it a failure if they have to take a house to public auction, not an opportunity to make a large profit. And let me just close by making four points about the, or, the lawsuit that was filed this morning. Number one, I hope the city settles this case quickly and amicably, amicably. Number two, the city should pay interest on surplus equity taken plus legal fees, just like the petitioner, the plaintiffs did. Number three, there may be other plaintiffs filing all across the state, including Greenfield. Number four, Greenfield should hold off on any further tax taking of public auctions through public auctions. The power of sale auctions can still take place with no excess equity taken. 
So I thank you for your past support committee members, and I hope that we will move forward on this. If, if, any, if there are any questions about the lawsuit that was filed this morning, I'd be happy to, to uh, give you information, but there will be a story in tomorrow's reporter about this, and I think some of you may have already seen that. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Thank you. Does anyone else who is present in person want to speak? Okay, I have Doug Suellen. Hi, thank you. Uh, Doug Selwyn, 38 Forest Avenue in Greenfield. Um, I would just echo what your three speakers have, have said already. Um, and they've got both the law and the details way beyond what I could um, could offer, except to say that it's um, it's just staggering to me that we have to go to this length in order to stop our our city government from basically stealing from our residents. It just I I get that that the Supreme Court has said it's illegal to do that, and that's great. Um, but it's morally and ethically just staggering to me that this is a practice that our city government is engaging in. Um, we're stealing from people, and why would we do that? So I urge you to to pass both <clears throat> amendments and recommend that to the full city council. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Mika Bowman. Can you hear me now? Yep, here we go. Yeah. Afternoon, hi, my name is Mika Bowman. I live at 43 Orchard Street in Greenfield. Um, I'm here also um, like the rest of the speakers to um, express my agreement with the adoption um, of these home equity reform amendments. Um, it, it, it seems that um, surplus equity taking is just indefensible as the Supreme Court has ruled. And while it seems to be happening across the country, um, there's no reason that we can't stop that here. Um, so I'm in favor of the ordinance committee passing on to city council, both of the proposals in their hand um, and hope that you will do so. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else online or in person who would like to speak? I would. You can, you can go for it. Uh, I, I'm Judith Maloney. I live on um, Beacon Street, 117 Beacon Street. Are, is, are we on, is this um, meeting unable to decide because there aren't three members and there aren't three members over something so important as this for the town there are three members there's four of us there. Well, i thought well, i thought you can if she loses if she loses if she it becomes a member no no we're, we're, we're all set we're all set yeah we're good there needs to be a quorum in person right she's sick so she sure. Just if she here. loses electricity, but there's another councillor still yeah. on, so there's still three of us. There's still three of you. Yes. So you can vote. Yes. We're, yeah. Okay. I, I just, I was like, I, it just seemed like, why, why are we here? No. Can I, can I just clarify the process, though, which is that all we do in a committee is we make a recommendation to the full council. So what our what our appointments and ordinance committee will do tonight is we will listen to the public. We will have um, a, an opportunity to debate and then we will make a recommendation to the full council. And at the council meeting next Wednesday, there will be a full council vote and that's what will pass or not pass this, this motion. Okay, that's great, thank you. You're welcome. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Madam Chair, can I clarify something for, for one, one, one no, minute? No, let's keep going, please. 
There's something that I, in tonight's in the article that's in tonight. It's wrong. Uh, it's, See, it's wrong. Do it at full council. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. stay in the three minutes. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry that I'm. I really right. apologize that I'm not there. I know it's hard, difficult when it's half online and half not. Um, <laughs> I am going to move us to the mayor's appointments um, that's next on the agenda. If there's no one else who hasn't spoken yet, who wants to speak? Okay, so for the mayor's appointments, I have to do something a little funky for this one. <clears throat> um, so, uh, one of the appointments, David Chichester has withdrawn. Um, so he will be stricken from the appointments when we get to our full council agenda. He's still on our current agenda because it it happened after the five day rule. So I'm going to read this order with without him on it, but um, it will be stricken when it comes to the full council. Um, so order number FY24012. The city council moved that it be ordered that the Greenfield City Council pursuant to charter section 2-10 affirms the following appointments by the mayor. The Human Rights Commission, Lance Smith, term to expire December 31st, 2026, majority vote required. Okay, second, Ricketts. Is there any discussion on this appointment? Okay, great. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> great. Um, any opposed? Okay, we will forward this recommendation to the full council. Um, next, we have adopt code city of Greenfield ordinance chapter 279 home equity. Article one, disposition of surplus equity. And uh it looks like oh do we um do we have a do we have a lawyer present for the city? Hello, Iris Leahy. I'm an attorney for um, the city of Greenfield and I reside in Holyoke, Massachusetts. Okay, great. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to speak when the public was there um, for their um, portion of you know of so you, you all have been invited to speak so what I'll do is we we're going to do the first um, we're going to do the first ordinance and then the second ordinance and so during the first ordinance I will leave space for debate and I will call on you all to give input if you feel that you need to give input on each motion um, and the the intent of this is so that there's time before the full council meeting so that all council members um, can ask lawyers question the city lawyers questions that they want might want clarified before they vote on this. Um, so I'm going to read this motion and just if um, you anyone who doesn't know just please refrain from putting anything except for your name and address in the in the chat. Um, so order number FY24009, City Council order, City of Greenfield, Massachusetts, the City Council moved that it be ordered that the Greenfield City Council amends the code of the City of Greenfield by adding Chapter 279 Home Equity Ordinance, Article 1, Disposition of Surplus Equity as follows. Pursuant to MGL Chapter 60, Section 87, the city directs the collector of taxes to use the power of sale to enforce a lien for taxes, not to exercise the power of taking under Chapter 60, Section 53, pursuant to the provision of MGL 183, Section 21, and 27.1. After an order of public sale of a foreclosed property, the distribution of proceeds shall treat the tax title holder, the city, like a mortgagee with the first priority interest in the proceeds from the property and treating the delinquent debtor, the property owner, as a mortgagor, rendering the surplus, if any, to the mortgagor. 
and further amends the table of contents and index of contents of the code and further that non-substantive changes to the numbering of the ordinance be permitted in order that it be in compliance with the numbering format of the code of the city of Greenfield. Majority vote required. I need someone to second it before we- Second, go. break it. Um, is there, so I'm just gonna open it up to conversation for committee, uh, committee members and if um, if the city attorneys, if you have any comments, you can um, feel free to raise your hands if there's any statements or things you'd want us to know about this motion before we uh, before we decide how to rec make recommendations to move it forward. Marianne, go. No, I'm here. Can you see me? Hear me? Yeah, you see that Jesse raised his hand. Oh, great. You can go for it. I can't okay. see your hand. I apologize. Thank you. These, I know these hybrid me meetings can be tricky. Um, so I'm going to defer to Iris on a lot of this stuff because she lives in the world of tax taking. But just sort of from a bigger picture on both the Supreme Court decision and the structure of it. Um, you know, the tax taking scheme is a state law um, that doesn't give a lot of discretion to municipalities and how they implement it and how they deviate from the state statutes. I don't see the state law as allowing a city or town to do what is proposed uh, in this ordinance. I think that it's governed by state law and that sort of trumps what uh, is being talked about here. I think that the efforts to do that in Boston are, are certainly worthwhile, and I think that makes sense for a venue for where a solution will come from. I think the the notice from DOR sort of speaks to that too, where they're, they're not saying you do or don't have to do anything, but that they're gonna let you sort of set aside funds from auctions if you so desire, so that they're there if the state tells you how to move next. Um, and then from a much bigger picture, looking at the Tyler case itself, you know, I think there's a real question here about whether the Massachusetts statutory scheme is impacted by the Tyler case. So getting setting aside sort of the moral ethical reasons that there may be to change this statutory structure, one of the things that they talk about on the Supreme Court in this case is um, that the, the Hennepin County scheme or statutory scheme didn't allow for any sort of process where the equity could be retained by the taxpayer. And they cited a, a New York case and a New York uh, statutory structure that is more akin to Massachusetts, where there is a vehicle for that and a procedure through the courts. So I think from the very starting point, I think there's a question about whether the structure that's in place right now is unconstitutional, as opposed to um, maybe, as some people would say, immoral, unethical, ill-advised, any of those words. Um, so I think all of that is probably some helpful background sort of for the discussion. Um, and I just wanted to sort of lay that groundwork. I think Iris might be able to offer a little more detail on the tax taking part, but that would be my take on the big picture stuff. I have a question in case you can't see my hand. Go for it, Sheila. So you just said that um, the structure in Massachusetts, it, can you, that's the first time that I've heard that. Can you please explain to me how the structure in Massachusetts is different from what we've been talking about from the Supreme Court ruling? Sure. And again, this is a recent case, a hot button issue. Uh, you know, it hasn't been resolved anywhere yet. But one of the key points in that Supreme Court decision was that, um, you know, the only there was no option for the taxpayer where they could recover the equity. In Massachusetts, there's a, a process and maybe Iris can get into this about um, when you first respond to the tax taking process, you can um, essentially force a sale where you would retain the equity. And so that is similar to what they use in New York State, where there was a, a case as well that they upheld that system of withholding the equity or retaining the equity. So I, I think the question of how that case impacts Massachusetts in the courts is still an open question. I think I think that's unresolved and, and not entirely clear. I, I, personally think it raises the underlying issue with the system, but it doesn't seem to strike that down necessarily the way I read it. I have, um, go ahead, Iris, before I ask my question, you go. Okay, thank you. 
Um, so I just wanted to mention again, I'm Iris Leahy. I represent the city of Greenfield and the tax title foreclosure matters solely. Um, I do want to say that I understand um, that the taxpayers and the municipality wants to all work together to try and figure out a way um, to proceed that's fair um, and that they have been following the law to date um, as it exists in the Commonwealth. And I, I agree with Jesse that right now, the way that the Massachusetts statutes are written, there is not a way to return um, the equity to any surplus equity to a property owner by statute. So there is going to have to be um, some thoughts in Boston and um, around the state to try and put um, something together that makes sense underneath the Supreme Court case. But also we have to look at that Supreme Court case, like Jesse said, um, they had mentioned that in New York, there's another process that's followed. That's not, con you know, it's not found to be unconstitutional where um, the surplus was not returned to people, but that would be maybe part of an answer um, that a person would give to the land court and they would claim their excess equity. So there, there is definitely among the legal community and the tax title community, a lot of buzz and a lot of interest on how this is gonna move forward, but it, it is gonna be um, something that we'll all have to work under, but I don't think that it's appropriate for a municipality to change the ordinance that would right now be against the law. Um, so there is obviously um, laws that say that ordinances can't be repugnant to the law. So unless the Commonwealth changes the statutes under chapter 60, then an ordinance that changes that statute is not gonna be enforceable anyways. Um, but what I wanted to say was that there is case law that's really helpful for people um, to understand how the tax title process works right now under the Commonwealth's um, statutory scheme, as they call it. Um, there's a case, it's Talage Lincoln LLC versus Jesse L. Williams. That was decided, I think, in 2020 by the Supreme Judicial Court. That gives a really good outline of how Massachusetts has to process their tax titles under the current statutory scheme. Um, and it does mention that we have to we have to work under the statutes as they are right now in Massachusetts, which may be considered archaic and arcane um, as the process of tax lien foreclosure. But this body of law is what we have to work under in Massachusetts. This kind of gives a reader's digest of a very comp what can be a very complicated process um, in the land court. But what I will say is on behalf of the city of Greenfield, we work together really hard to help the property owners understand this process. I'm, I often will say, I'm not your attorney. And the last thing we wanna do is take your property, but the taxes have to be paid and the treasurer has a fiduciary duty to collect the taxes. There are reasons um, that you would have to proceed under the law to collect the taxes and not collecting the taxes is not an option. In that Talage case that I was just mentioning, again, it's Talage Lincoln LLC versus Jesse L. Williams. In that case, um, it mentions that the way that the tax title foreclosure process works in Massachusetts is not the same way that a mortgage foreclosure works. It's a strict foreclosure. It's not a power. Um, it's a, known as a strict foreclosure, and it's different in several important ways from a foreclosure by power of sale, which is how a mortgage foreclosure generally proceeds. And what I could say is a lot of the properties that have equity in them um, that owe taxes rather than to lose the property, they either try and find financing because a lot of these, just like this case mentions, don't have mortgages on the property. So if you have equity in your home, generally you don't let it go to a foreclosure for tax for tax title. And the city of Greenfield does offer um, payment plans um, as a courtesy to people in order to not proceed to foreclose. So it's not that that's the first thing that Greenfield does, it's the last thing they want to do. Um, to collect the taxes, but I strongly suggest to my clients and to Greenfield to wait to see what happens um, as far as the legislature um, making the rules rather than the city. And I understand also that DLS um, bulletin says, okay, we understand um, this is unsettled and uncertain, I think is the word they used, um, but they give the 
the city and other municipalities the option to use an agency fund, which is a temporary place to, it's kind of, if you want to think of it like an escrow account. So if the city was to auction a property that was foreclosed on any surplus, and this is what I've been telling all my clients, would need to be set aside until there's a decision because the Supreme Court case itself, it, it's not every situation. As you can see in New York, they said that's not unconstitutional. It's not every situation and that, that surplus will have to be returned. And honestly, it's not often that there is surplus. So what happens, my concern with these ordinances too, is what happens right now is that we don't proceed against a taxpayer um, civilly if, they, if there's no equity in the property. So let's say the property is assessed at 30,000 and the taxes end up being 70,000. So the town there is at a deficit, but we don't generally go and file a civil action against a person which would affect their credit, which would, you know, it would open a whole new can of worms and it would be expensive, time consuming. It's not something that the city would normally do. But if that happens, because like I said, most people that have equity in their properties redeem whatever means they need to, which can be financing or um, you know, seeking a mortgage, or I always suggest people look into grant programs that are out there and I give them the information for that on behalf of the municipalities that I represent. But it, it, it worries me um, without having the guidance from our state legislature to move forward at, with these ordinances that I think, like Jesse said, may be in violation of the current statutes in the Commonwealth. Thank you. Um... So my main question, I want to be clear, we have two separate ordinances here. We're discussing the ordinance that is related to the city directing the collector of taxes to use the power of sale to enforce a lien for taxes, not to exercise the power of taking under chapter 60. And so my question is, and I am not a tax attorney or an attorney of any kind um but is well my first question is what happens if we pass an ordinance that directs our tax collector to stop um to stop taking putting to, to stop taking uh under chapter 60 and then and it's like out of compliance with the law what like what happens the state kicks it back to us and says. That would be something I would have to look at. I know that you can't, you can't violate the statutes of the Commonwealth. Um, and if you, you know, if you create an ordinance that does that, I believe it's void, but maybe Jesse would know better. I don't, I'm not sure about ordinances really, because like I said, I solely practice tax title. It's not a situation you want to get into. Um, for towns, your ordinance, your, their bylaws go to the attorney general for approval, but for cities, that's not the case. Okay. So this would take effect. And in essence, city officials who take these acts would have to decide whether they were going to comply with the laws of the Commonwealth or the ordinance as written. I would personally advise them to comply with the laws of the Commonwealth, but I think either way, you're probably going to end up in court litigating about this and e even in this first motion that we have here even though it, this motion is not about um this first motion is not about what happens with the money right it's just about ordering um it's just about ordering our tax collector to not exercise the power of taking mm -hmm. and the and section 87 says a city or town may by ordinance or by law respectively direct its collector shall exercise the power of sale or the power of taking to enforce the lien of taxes. So the saying a city or town may doesn't mean that they also may not. I, I think, and Iris can talk about this, I don't think that's the same situation we're talking about here. I think the statutory language in there is talking about the sale of the tax lien to private companies. Is that right, Iris? That That's what I was understanding when I read that statute, um, that, you know, because after you put the tax lien on the property, so taxes automatically become a lien, whether you put the tax taking on the property, which is called perfecting the lien, 
That's basically like putting it on record, making sure that, you know, in five years, it's not extinguished because the property has been sold and et cetera. There's a whole bunch of rules related to that. But if you have a tax lien on the property and you enforce a, a sale, you can sell your tax lien um, to an investor like Talich, which the court frowns upon basically because um, investors are not um, as deferential to property owners as the land court is and as municipalities are to their constituents. Um, by statute, like I said, there's um, payment agreements that can be offered. Um, that's not the same for an investor. Um, they solely are you know, looking at it as an investment, um, not really having that personal connection to the people who I know for sure, the treasurer in the city of Greenfield, you know, she has that personal connection with people and is fair and tries to, you know, treat everyone the same. But I think that if you enforce a power of sale before you go through the tax title foreclosure process, then you, the goal, right, if we're not looking to unhouse citizens of Greenfield, doesn't that seem a little bit harsh? Because what you would do, rather than go through this long process where property owners get piles of letters from the city, they get letters from me, they get letters from the land court, they get a, the opportunity to address the land court. They, it's this long process that's fair to property owners. But instead, I think what is being suggested here is rather than go through that fair process, which most municipalities use, um, is to go ahead and auction their property quickly, which would unhouse them. And then they get whatever's left for equity. Sometimes people don't redeem or don't want to look for, um, don't want to sell their property in these tax title cases because they are on um, public assistance. And they say, well, if I sell my property, it's going to change my benefits and I then I won't have my benefits. So I, as I always say, I'm not your attorney. And I do suggest that that's something that concerns you. You should retain an attorney to help you understand that. But if you don't right now under the statutes of the Commonwealth, if you don't address the balance by trying to sell it or getting a mortgage or something like that, you are going to lose the equity. But if the laws in the Commonwealth end up changing, which they have not yet, but I believe there are bills um, that are being considered, um, if that changes, then they still have this fair process that we go through, in my opinion, the tax title foreclosure process, where we try so hard to work with people to make sure they understand the process, because like I said, it's kind of confusing and archaic, as the court says, arcane. But if you go ahead and immediately publicly sell somebody's property as like a mortgage company would, then I don't see how that I don't see how that solves the problem. I understand uh, that they would continue to retain their equity in that position, but they lost their house. And if there's not enough to pay, because a lot of these properties in tax title are either abandoned or contaminated or whatever, then what happens if there's not enough? Then we have to also bring a civil suit against them to try and recover, which we're not going to recover anything if they don't have the money to pay the taxes and redeem the property. Just, it, there's a lot of questions I have and a lot of concerns I have. But what I would say is if you put, a, if a tax lien exists on a property, which it does automatically as soon as taxes are issued, and then you decide not to put a taking on the property, which I don't suggest doing, you could lose the right to collect that balance because by statute, you would think because it needs to be fair, you can't just one day say, okay, well, you know, the tax has been due for 15 years and it got sold a few times, but nobody knows about it, but now we're gonna go ahead and take that property, that's not fair. So there's a window of time that you can exercise um, that, that lien option by perfecting the lien, by putting it on record, but it exists whether you record it or not. So if it wasn't recorded, if that tax lien wasn't recorded and 15 years from now, the property wasn't sold and the same person still lives there, then the city could say, hey, by the way, now we're going to foreclose on this lien and there's, you know, all this interest that's due and all these taxes. And that's not how Greenfield operates. Greenfield is very methodical, very fair, very consistent and make sure that everyone is aware of what's going on and waiting um, to do anything is not helpful for anyone because of the giant interest rate that's not set by Greenfield, it's set by statute. I think 
I think what I really want to say is that I think that the state legislature needs to hear the concerns because I think that's where things could change. And I don't think that putting this burden on Greenfield to make the changes that I believe would be in violation of the current general laws of Massachusetts, I don't think is fair. Thank you. Do any of the other committee members, Councilor Golub? So I'm gonna just think out loud for a moment. The first thing I wanna say is I am finding myself uh, uh, <laughs> wishing I could listen to that at three, uh, slow that way down. Um, this is not a world in which I operate frequently, tax liens and mortgages, etc. And after a couple of minutes, that kind of went over my head. And I want to understand what you just told us, but I just want to be very frank and say, not yet. I uh, I just want to state that. Actually, um, <laughs> I don't even know what question to ask yet. You hit the record button from this point forward. I'm realizing that is that not recorded. I don't know if it automatically. I have not. I didn't. It says it is. Okay, good. Because <laughs> great, great, great. I just had a moment of panic that we didn't record that. <laughs> Me too. When you said that. All right. Thank um, you. Sorry. All you have to say is do over. So I am certain. <laughs> I'm certain that I will would will maybe have many follow up questions, but my brain just. <laughs> I see you nodding. Um, but I do. I do want to go back to, there are maybe two points that I want to make. Um, one is I heard um, Jesse say we need to set aside moral issues. That kind of, I feel like I have a responsibility to the constituents of Greenfield in many ways. Um, and uh, and I'm taking this, this situation very seriously. Um, and, I, and I am not yet fully decided, but I am not willing to set aside the moral issues. Um, and the protecting the, the city legally does feel like part of my responsibility, which is why I'm taking this seriously. Um, and I want to go back to Marianne's question and, um, and see if I'm understanding this accurately. My, I think that your question was, what happens if the city passes an ordinance that is um, not in compliance with state law um, and that you said that the the decision would be up to city officials um, and that that could lead to litigation. Is that the worst case scenario or what have and, and I'm curious in general, what happens if the city passes an ordinance that is out of compliance with state statute? I also have the state statute here. And so I'm also wondering if we actually are out of compliance with state, would be out of compliance with state statute. But I just want to under, make sure I'm understanding you that it would be up to city officials to, to determine which, this, which they would enforce, and then it could lead to litigation. Is that the worst case or what happens in that situation? I mean, well, so, I mean, I, as a municipal attorney, I would say it's a pretty horrible worst case scenario for municipal employees. But um, you know, what the when those officials take their oath of office, they have to uphold the laws of the Commonwealth Constitution, all of those things, and their supremacy, right, in order of what needs to go into effect. So they, where there's a conflict between a local ordinance and a state law, I would say they are compelled to comply with the state law. I would expect that someone would then file suit against them and the city, and we would be litigating this in court. Um, I, I, so that's, I don't think there's a scenario where anybody can sort of, if this gets passed, and I think there's some language issues and confusion in the actual language of the bylaw that's proposed as well, but if it were to get passed, I don't think there's a scenario where anybody in City Hall would be able to just sort of implement this and operate this way because of the conflict with state law. And just to clarify my comment on the moral issues, what I was saying is simply that I don't believe that the Supreme Court decision necessary, necessarily compels a change in Massachusetts state statute, but I do think there may be moral and ethical reasons to do that. So I'm saying, I, I would agree with you that I think the moral considerations are valid and necessary to be considered. I just think they have to be considered in Boston instead of in Greenfield. Okay, and my other question was just, again, kind of repeating what Councillor Bullock was saying. It, 
as I read the Mass General Law Chapter 60, Section 87, it, my read of this is that it, there is a lot of discretion. I'll just, I want to read it for everyone present to know what we're talking about. It says, a city or town may, by ordinance or bylaw, respectively, direct whether its collectors shall, a city or town may, by ordinance or bylaw, respectively, direct whether its collectors shall exercise the power of sale or the power of taking to enforce the lien for taxes, and in default of such ordinance or bylaw, the collector may exercise either power at his, either power at his discretion, but the passage of any such ordinance or bylaw shall not render invalid any proceedings then pending. As I read all those maze and discretion, it doesn't, it sounds like there is a lot of discretion there. Can you respond? Yes, I think that you're right to focus and you would make a good law student on the mays and um, the difference between a may and a must and a shall. Um, but yeah, so in this, the exercising the power of sale, um, if you look to at, um, I think there, I think it might be helpful to say that I think that the reference to that in the first ordinance is kind of um, misinterpreting the law. So under 87, um, if you look to also chapter 60, section 2C, which gives you all the definitions, um, it says that any premium under the exercise of the power of sale goes to a general fund from the tax sale receivables. It doesn't get returned to a property owner like that. What this this ordinance is suggesting is a misinterpretation of the law and kind of a suggestion on a way to change the law that doesn't that isn't up to Greenfield. So yes, a the Greenfield can exercise the power of sale, which like I said would immediately unhouse somebody um, and affect their credit and yes, they would have their their equity back, depending on what that is. Um, that would also, in my opinion, um, open up the city of Greenfield to other lawsuits such as, did Greenfield sell the property for the appropriate amount? Is this the only taxpayer that's due any, if there was surplus, um, what, like I said, the exercise of the power sale here, any premium, any surplus goes to the general fund, doesn't go back to a property owner. So trying to use the statutes as they exist right now to solve this problem this way, I wouldn't suggest. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or if it gives you more questions, but that, it, it, go ahead, Jesse. I'll just add, I mean, so one of the principles that we have in municipal law as well, in municipal finance is that we can't use public money for a private purpose. The constitution addresses that, statute addresses it. And so you run into problems here where the statute has defined the the proceeds from that sale as public funds and it doesn't give discretion to give that back to anybody it wouldn't give the discretion to give it back to the original property owner or anybody else in town or outside of town it has to be used for a municipal public purpose so without statutory authority um you always i get nervous whenever there's a discussion about using public funds to the benefit of a private person or entity. And you might say it's not really to the benefit of that person because they were the property owner, but under the state law, you're saying this is essentially a gift from the city to that person because it's already been designated by state law as public funds once they're received. And can you answer a question for me about that? In Massachusetts, do we have any exempt populations from that like anti-aid? um section of mass general law like it like i know some states have um exempt populations like you could you could give aid to a veteran or to someone who qualifies as like indigent or whatever like does massachusetts quantify anybody as um exempt from the anti-aid law the General question is no, it's a pretty complicated, the anti-aid amendment is pretty complex, but it's more around the edges and how it's interpreted, not in any exempt groups or classes. Okay. And then my other question for you is, 
it, what is the legal mechanism that we could utilize now that would restrict um, our collector from to put a pause um, or stop any further taking or sales while we wait for guidance from from the state or federal um, lawmakers? Is there a way for us to legally like, like I'm thinking of like building permits, which don't get done in a timely manner because in inspections because we don't have enough because we don't have a fully staffed um, thing or health inspections or maybe those are different than this, but I'm just thinking like, how do we pause this now while we wait for legal guidance? That might be an iris question. I'm not sure that there is a way. I would say too, that this isn't something that happens quickly. So I think there's a lot of, and by this, I mean the actual foreclosure and sale of these properties. So um, I think that there's a natural lead time anyway. Um, I also think you run into problems. Iris mentioned sort of fiduciary duty of the tax collector to sort of obtain these revenues that are public funds, they're unpaid taxes. And you can run into problems where you're sort of opting not to enforce. And it doesn't take too long, right, where people all sort of decide, well, if no one's enforcing this, why am I writing my check every quarter or whatever? So there, there's a lot of permutations of that. I, I can't think off the top of my head of a way to um, pause the whole process. Doesn't mean there isn't one, but I don't know how I would do that. I'm not aware either. Um, maybe that's like a Department of Revenue question. Um, but I, I agree with what Jesse said that that, you know, like it would violate the fiduciary duty. And I don't know if when the city gets audited, if that would become a problem um, because you're not, like you said, collecting taxes that must be collected. Um, I don't know if that would affect the treasurer's bond. I, I don't know. There's a lot of questions I don't have the answers to, but um, I don't know of a way to pause the action. Uh, but I, I don't know that there are any options planned. Um, and if there were, um, any surplus would be, you know, instructed by legal counsel to be put in an agency fund. And do we have any, um, does anyone here tonight have any data on how many properties we like currently have in queue for for tax taking in Greenfield? The treasurer provides me a, a list of properties that have the tax liens placed on them. Um, and then after that, I go through and I try and contact the property owners, things like that. I do have a list, um, but it's not been updated in a good while. But the treasurer, um, who I know can't be here this evening, um, would have an updated list that she could get you from um, Munis quickly if you asked her for it. So. Okay. Al, do you have that information? I will allow you to give us that if you have that specific information. I, I, uh, I will tell you that there are currently six properties from 2020 and 2021 that were that had excess home equity taken. And the total there was around $400,000 in, in, in equity that does not belong to the to the town. It never was. And I don't, uh, attorney uh, Timmons is talking about public money this this was not this is not public money this is this is money that the, the supreme court has said is the is the equity of the home former homeowner so i, yeah. I haven't i haven't That's heard question, no. I, I haven't heard an 87 response to section 87 let me just make a procedural point here. But the, you've see, had two now, attorneys. I'm, that's not the question. Oh, hold you've on. Allowed, I, you've allowed two I attorneys. Have to follow the, I'm really sorry, Al. I have to follow They the should have spoken no. first and then let the public comment on This is a crazy procedure. That They're going to have a whole other meeting next Wednesday. Oh, where we have, we have, yeah, next I week wish week. you had told us you were going to be it's, here. It's the, Al, the question, though, is do you know how many properties are currently in the queue? That are currently at risk of having their title taken. I think that the assessor published a list. I'd have to look it up. I think it was no. around 36 okay. properties. You hear me? Okay. Around 36 properties that were in a public notice. I think it was in in July. I can look it up for you. Okay, um, I, I, I have will it send on my phone. I have the list on my phone. Tomorrow to the um to the collector and ask if we can get an updated right. list. I was going to say we have. I have it right here. Do you want me to look and, it up? No. No, I will. 
I'll get it from a full pound. It's around 36 properties. I'll get it from the current, but I do want to just say that I what I understand, like I I agree. I will state for the sake of moving this conversation forward and getting to our next topic. Um I I agree with the with the sentiment of both of these motions. And I also believe that we should find a way, legally explore a way, and there must be other cities and towns that are talking about this in Massachusetts currently because of the Supreme Court decision, that I believe we should find a way to pause any more tax taking. The issue of returning the money, what I understand what Jesse said, and I'm sorry, I'm calling you by your first name and I literally can't see your last name, so I'm sorry. What Jesse said is that, like, we've already taken that money and I'm I'm dealing with this um, in other realms of money in Greenfield where I'm trying to figure out how to give money to people uh, for the opioid settlement funds and things like that. I just took a deep dive into the anti-aid amendment. Uh, and reached out to some other municipalities who are giving cash directly to uh, members of the community. And so that money's already been taken. And so now we legally don't have a mechanism to give it back at this moment. I don't believe we won't have a mechanism to give it back or we shouldn't have a mechanism to give it back. Um, but I do understand as I read the anti-aid amendment in depth after I met with Diana Schindler the other day and we talked about it, um, that that money, now that it's been taken, it has to follow the state law of how, how we would how we would return it. And there isn't, there isn't a mechanism right now. So um, what I want to do is, Schindler want to speak, your connection we can't hear you this to a what um one second one minute okay is that better it's not great, but it's, but I heard, we heard what you just said. Is that better? Can you guys hear me yeah, now? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. I kicked my entire family off the net, so hopefully this will work. Mm -hmm. um, what I would like to do for the, for the sake of our agenda and time is move, is move us to a vote, um, knowing that this is going to go to the full council and there will be a robust discussion, discussion there. I would also like to invite um, the two lawyers who attended tonight to attend uh, either in person or remotely to our next Wednesday council meeting. I probably need like the blessing of the president and the vice president or something, but I will reach out to them tomorrow to make sure that that can happen. Does any other committee member have a question that they would like to ask or any other discussion before we move this forward? Uh Two things. One, this doesn't fully answer your question about how to stop title taking right now. I don't think that this is an adequate response, but if I'm hearing correctly, the DOR has stated that they will allow municipalities to set aside the funds of the of the titles that are taken. I'm not proposing that that is the full answer to this, but I'm wondering if I'm understanding that correctly and if and if that is one thing that we might do. Yeah, if I can respond, um, the DOR put out a bulletin recently saying, I understand there's some uncertainty about what to do if there are surplus funds in a tax title foreclosure um, auction. And they said, we will allow you to put those funds in what they call an agency fund, which is a temporary fund um, for a municipality to use so that we can wait to get guidance on what to do with surplus funds if they do need to be returned to a property owner after an auction of a property and how, how that all looks. But it's a temporary way to put that surplus somewhere that is allowed by DOR because otherwise right now under the statutes, um, it's not supposed to be put 
like we said, into a temporary agency fund that's supposed to go to the city. Um, I think I think Greenfield might put it in a general fund. I'm not exactly sure, but um, the treasurer would know exactly. But it's an allowance um, by the DOR to put that money from an auction of a property um, that's been foreclosed on temporarily aside to wait for guidance. Councillor Gilmore, did you have something? Yeah, I'm wondering, I mean, if we're waiting for guidance from Boston, I, I wonder if it makes more sense to table this. I mean, I don't wanna vote in an ordinance that we can't enforce but I also don't want to vote against this because of all of the moral and ethical reasons we've discussed. I, ju I just don't want to put us in a legal bind. Yeah, I'm in the same position and I'm in the same position of like, it's great that we have guidance from the DOR that says when you take pro a people's equity and from there to put it in a, to put it in a fund, but that doesn't, like, what I'm actually more concerned about is that we're kicking people, like, who are elderly and on fixed incomes, and we already have a housing problem in Greenfield. Like, what I actually want is for us to stop taking people's homes in the immediate, and we can deal with the $400,000. Um, so, I mean... What I'm inclined to do is for us to vote on this tonight, knowing that it's going to go to full council, and then we can have the conversation and it can be tabled there. Um, or we can get guidance in the next week from other municipalities who are dealing with this um, and maybe ask more questions of the lawyer of the lawyers between now and next Wednesday to not stop this um i don't i'm like torn on tabling this sort of means nothing is being done if we at least vote right now our vote isn't binding to move this into effect because we're only a committee so it means it stays open until it gets to council next week and if we have to table it there due to legal reasons we can Does that make sense to other yes. committee members? Yes. Can, can I just make sure that makes sense to me? So if if a committee tables an ordinance, it doesn't go to full council like that. I want this to be talked about at the full council. And if we and I am also inclined currently to table, even though that's not really what I want to do, it, do we have to like, can we vote to Am I making sense? Like, do, can we vote to table here and have it be discussed there? Or do we have to vote yes or no now can, in order to We can there? vote to send no recommendation. Yeah. We have table this whole here. discussion there, and then they'll either table it or they'll vote. Yeah, I think if we table it here, we can't talk about it at the next council. But if we do vote, if we say there was no recommendation, and we can obviously explain why, um, then we can have it on our full council agenda. Sheila, do you have something else? Yeah, if we table it here, that doesn't change what's on the agenda. So it would still come up. Because um, like you said, this is a committee that makes recommendations. We don't make decisions. So tabling it here would just, in essence, be us not making a recommendation at all. Just like if our meeting had to get canceled, there wouldn't be a recommendation. It doesn't stop it from moving forward. Well, I guess just like round table, who would people rather table it or would people rather just make a symbolic recommendation until next Wednesday? Or no recommendation? Make a motion that we forward no recommendation to full council. I'll okay. second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Was there any yeah, other? Stop beating it. Okay. Do we want to do the same with the next? Um, because we did sort of talk about both of these. Um, I do have to read the motion, I believe. Um, 
but let's read the motion and then we'll decide if we need to have a discussion on it. Uh, order number FY24010. The City Council moved that it be ordered that the Greenfield City Council amends the code of the City of Greenfield by adding Chapter 279. Uh, yeah, 279 Home Equity Ordinance Article 2, provision of restitution as follows. Based upon the property auction records of the tax collector, the city shall make reasonable efforts to contact all property owners who fall within the statute of limitations and who are subject to unconstitutional surplus equity taking to offer said property owners compensation for any excess equity taken, plus interest calculated from the date of taking by the city up to, to the date of the final restitution, and further amends the table of contents and index of contents of the code and further that non-substantive changes to the numbering of the ordinance be permitted in order that it be in compliance with the numbering format of the code of the city of Greenfield. Majority vote required. Second, Ricketts. Great. Do so, we, does anyone have anything they want to discuss on this one or do we want to do the same thing and make a motion I to- I'm wondering why this one doesn't go to ways and means. Hmm. Hmm. I don't remember there being a discussion of that in chairs. It was just put with us, um, but we can, we can definitely bring that up in our Wednesday meeting. Right, yeah. Yeah, so I make a motion that we move it forward with no recommendation. And I like Shayla's idea of bringing up that maybe it should go to ways and means. Wait, uh, wait someone has to second it. I'll second. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you, um, lawyers. Who? <laughs> thank you for your time. Um, mm -hmm. I do. I do want to invite you to our meeting. It starts yeah. at six thirty um, on next Wednesday. If you are able to come, please do. I believe there will be. Uh, a lot of questions. I'm gonna. I will ask my colleagues to watch this recording before they get there. So hopefully we can preserve your time and ours. Sounds good. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you so much. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Dave, for waiting. <laughs> yes. Thank you for waiting. Um. So okay. Okay. our next discussion is amendment to Greenfield Charter chapter 611 public safety commission updated version um i have some cliff notes that i'm just going to go over for folks in case you didn't um, oh, yeah, you want to come up here oh yeah you can definitely join up join the table if you would yeah. like to. you're yeah, an you, you involved too you're okay. an invited yeah you're both invited guests <laughs> Yes. Madam Chair, Ed Jarvis, I'm on. I'm on the Zoom. Thank you, Ed. Okay. Oh, Ed's here too. Okay. Yeah. So, um, just for context for this, um, the what's in the packet, um, what is in bold was already sent to Boston to amend the charter. We haven't heard back yet from that. Um, okay. okay. What is in red is suggestions that Councillor Forgey um, proposed some months ago now, maybe even a year ago, to be honest, um, that she proposed we bring up and we didn't have a full body of the Public Safety Commission at that time. Um, so, the for just a brief overview the major changes that are not just sort of uh um like adding the and changing some minute language um is to make the seven members um have designated liaisons so there would be two designated liaisons to each um there would be two designated liaisons to the police department, two to the public dispatch, um, an elected chair, and two to the fire department, and that the commission would decide who those liaisons are. So that's one change. Um, there is 
I think five major changes to the complaints process. One is um, clarification of conduct um, of, oh wait, sorry, there's a compensation as well. There's a compensation piece, which adds uh, consideration for compensation. There isn't an amount attached to it. I'd actually wanted to get clarification from Councillor Forgey on this piece, just because none of our other commissions um, right are funded that I know of. And so I'd like to get clarification on that piece. But then the other significant changes to the co written complaints process um, is that there is clarification around conduct of um, department heads. So it makes it so that the commission and the, the mayor would jointly investigate department heads in accordance with contract and MGL um, and all of those results and complaints would be made public. The next is that there would be a hearing officer appointed to for each complaint until the complaint is resolved. And that person would investigate the complaint, return their findings to the full commission, um, and render a recommendation for action. And a, in each new complaint has a new hearing officer assigned to it. So it's not like one person is the hearing officer oh. in... In so is that different than whoever the person is for each department? Like you said, there'll be somebody for the police, somebody for the fire, somebody for the dispatchers. Yeah, but my understanding from the way it's written is that the hearing officer is elected by the Public Safety Commission as the complaints come in. And then they remain that hearing officer. So if you have three complaints, you'd have three hearing officers um at a time um and i think the idea was one to not overburden one person if there was multiple complaints um and two to rotate so that you're not dealing with one point of view and one person over and over again um and then there is the other one is that all written complaints are forwarded to a chief of department who does their own um their own investigation and then returns the findings um and the you know whatever was deemed appropriate after the investigation to the public safety commission so um i have a question about that do the complaints only go to the chief or does it go to the chief in the public safety at the same time you mean currently you want to know currently and i'm hoping that's the way it's going to be because i don't want names to be looked at and it's like oh this is a real complaint this one we don't care about you know what i, mean? I can answer that if you like yes, so cu currently i ask the uh departments so there's uh, complaints can come in five or ten different ways can be verbal it can be written mm -hmm. it could be to the public safety commission it could be to the mayor it could be to the chiefs so i ask the departments to document all complaints so in report all complaints either on a monthly or qu quarterly basis to, to the the, the uh, public safety commission so some complaints go directly to post and nobody knows about the complaints oh. right so there's a lot of different ways that can com complaints come in but if a complaint comes in to the public safety commission commissioners we do forward that on to the appropriate departments Okay. So the challenge is, is that can complaints can come in uh, many different ways, um, and they don't always officially come through the Public Safety Commission um, because individuals can, can write do complaints whatever way they feel deemed necessary. Um, so uh, I think so. So anything that does come in through the Public Safety Commission does go to the the chiefs or the department heads right now, if we got a complaint. Um, and we could also take action on that complaint too. So it can go to the chief or, or the chiefs or EMS. They can do as this states their investigation and they'll have to report to us. But that doesn't mean we can't start our own investigation okay. um, for, about that complaint. And as long as the complaint knows that a complaint has come in and somebody sees it because you know i'm just thinking i don't want like a mayor to ever get blindsided like you know like the public safety commission always knew or a chief knew 
but then the mayor mm -hmm. didn't know. Like, I just <clears throat> want to make yeah. sure that it's just transparent. So, so that's one reason why that's one reason why we asked the departments to catalog the complaints so the Public Safety Commission can re review that catalog when they feel necessary. So the Public Safety Commission doesn't investigate every single complaint. If it goes to post and it's something that post is handling, we might not necessarily do an investigation on that or maybe not even got that complaint, but we can be made aware of that complaint because I asked them to log all the complaints so we can review all the complaints for every department. And this new, this new language, um, this new language, my interpretation of it is that any complaints would be made public, like the results of all complaints except for ones yeah. that are protected by um by law but all other complaints would be made public and then there's another piece in here that says that the commission shall adopt rules and regulations consistent with the ordinance the civil service laws collective bargaining agreements to establish procedures to be followed in filing written complaints by the public investigating complaints holding hearings concerning complaints made in regard to its operation of the public safety departments and the conduct of the officers and employees of each department, citizen complaints shall be made part of the employee's personnel file. And I believe your the commission was working on a procedure for complaint process. Is that true? We we asked each department to come to us with a, their process. The fire department never had a process. So we asked them to come to us and they did that with their with their internal process. So there's an internal process for both the fire department and the police department on how they handle and, and document complaints at this point in time, which we never, we had one for the police, but I asked them to up, upgrade it, uh, update it. So now currently the police have one and the fire department has one. Um, EMS is a private entity and they have their own, but they do have a public complaint policy um, you know, as a private in, independent um, department. Um, so I made some notes, I think uh, probably commissioner, do you have probably comments and notes. So, some of the, I, I am concerned about a couple, some of the wording and if I could just kind of mention that if, for, yeah. for the discussion. So can I pause yeah. you for a oh, second? Yes, because absolutely. I want to fully understand what you're saying. And oh, I have sure. A couple yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I yes, so yes, pause. Yes, absolutely. Yes, pause. Um, sure. So if the complaint goes to the department or goes somewhere besides the Public Safety Commission, yeah. So is there a process for the department to investigate it separately? This may have already been said, but I just want to make sure I'm following because I'm seeing if the if the complaint goes to the Public Safety Commission. It's forwarded to the chief or the department, and they're made aware of it. But you named all those different channels that yeah. complaints can come through. Yeah. If it comes through one that's not the Public Safety Commission, how is it investigated? I, I've always been under, under the assumption that the Public Safety Commission would be the investigating body, but it sounds like some things are investigated <clears throat> within the departments. And, 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 so it's, you know, we don't, Greenfield doesn't have a clear. So that's one of my concerns, Okay. all right, as a public safety commissioner. Yeah. The public safety commission, we don't have a clear documented outline of investigating things. Okay. So the problem that I have with that coming from where, where I come from in the security world is that if, if, the, if, we have, if, we have, if we have a public safety commission of five or seven or 10 or whatever amount of people, uh -huh. And somebody decides, okay, Maria, you're going to investigate this complaint, right? And then Joe, you're going to investigate this complaint. I'm not putting anybody down uh -huh. or, or saying, but what are the rules in the procedures to do a correct investigation, right? right? Yeah. They, when you do an investigation, you're, you have, I'm going to say two people, like I won't, you know, there's two entities that are involved and out of respect and out of, you know, professionalism, we have to have a better path on how do we actually do an investigation? Yeah. You know, you could have a public safety commissioner that's never been in the security field, has never dealt with 
any of this yeah. and how, and you know the chair decides okay you're going to do this investigation one you don't want to overwhelm that person and one you want to make sure they do it right legally right. so we really need the public safety commission really needs to come up with the documentation so all public safety commissioners can understand how do we truly do a right. professional and real investigation other than calling people up and asking questions right. and that takes me to my one of my questions is that i don't have a problem with complaints with the public you will on, down on here results of all complaints will be made public so i'm a little bit concerned about that because if you make a complaint about an officer or a fire person or somebody involved in the department you might not want the public to know what your complaint is you might be afraid you might be scared you might not want anybody to know your business so th this is why, so I'll give you for an instance, we received a complaint a couple of months ago from an individual um, person. They weren't a Greenfield um, resident, they were out of town. Mm -hmm. And they, they sent the complaint over to the Public Safety Commission and I actually did the investigation. Um, and I'm not gonna go into what my steps were, um, but I, it, it, it was a complaint against the chief um, and we took it very seriously, but we did it in executive session because of the, what the person wrote out about concern about their privacy. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we just automatically make every complaint out there to mm -hmm. the public. We have to, we have to be concerning about the situation. So that's a little concerning to me that all complaints are made public. Mm -hmm. Maybe the results can be made public that there was a complaint and it involved X party and Y party, and this is what the outcome was. So, but I'm not sure that you know we want to put people's names out there. Yeah. So we could we could do it as a general. There was a complaint, yeah. and this is what the outcome was. But we have to be very careful about privacy. Is all I'm saying. So I'm am concerned a little bit concerned about how much how we write it and who's responsible to put it out to the public. That's all. I think it's a great idea. We want the public to know how, what the complaints are, but we have to be careful on how we, we handle them and how we put them out to the public. That's all I'm saying. There was a recommendation a while ago, at least a year ago, um, that there would be a place on the new website. This was before the new website went into effect, but that there would be like a form on the Public Safety Commission website that was like a, you know, an open form where someone could say, could, could file a complaint to the public mm -hmm. safety commission. Because right now, if you Google like Greenfield Public Safety Commission complaint process, you get taken to the Greenfield Public Safety Commission web page on our city web page, but there's nowhere on there does it say like, if you have a complaint about a city department, here's how you file it. And so I think we could easily have a form, a feedback form on that page that serves as a transparent process for people to file a complaint and there easily be a checkbox that says, do you want your name and your PII kept confidential um, or are you okay with it being made public? I think that that level of I think that, that transparency be, yeah, I think allows- that could work. Yeah, I, I know that the I know that the police department has a form online. They, they do. I think um, it's like drop a dime or something. I know. I know the police department has a form. I believe they also have written forms, hand hard copies in their lobby. Um, but the thing with the history that I've experienced is that complaints come in six different ways from whatever, right? So some people call anonymously. Every complaint has to take seriously. So if it's, even if it's an anonymous complaint, it has to take seriously. But they come in through the phone, they come in through calling the fire or police department, they get a handwritten note from the chief, they do fill out, the one that I received was the official form from the police departments. Um, and it, 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 you know, so it was very detailed. Um, you know, they come in so many different ways that it'd be great to, be able to have someone to click on the Public Safety Commission webpage and have the form right there. And then that form gets sent to the Public Safety Commission right away. Um, I think those are really all good positive things to, to do. But I don't know if we could stop like 
and have the public just complain one way. Mm -hmm. You know, I think people are going to do what they're going to do. And mm -hmm. you have to accept a complaint no matter which way they write the complaints. Um, what, first of all, I'd like to, to let everybody know this is my first official meeting. And I don't do not know what the process is in the, you know, in the commission right now, what they do, how they, you know, uh, handle complaints. But I, I am concerned about that one thing about sharing everything mm -hmm. because you, once you make a complaint, once you even insinuate that mm -hmm. someone did something wrong, you've damaged that person's you know, mm -hmm. reputation without really knowing if it was a, you know, a valid complaint. So I'm concerned about that piece. The other piece is, is that, um, yes, we do want to be transparent, um, but in the in the process that is in that well maybe is being proposed here um it's not really to me it's not really being totally transparent so there i, I think this this whole thing has a lot of work to to be done yeah i think there is um hold on i will, i'll I just saw the Ed, your hand went up there. There's a lot of, there is work to be done on this. And tonight was really just to open this discussion. One, I know there was a hope that the public safety commission would come out with their own written procedure for complaints. And then just yeah. to address the like validity of complaints is that my understanding is that the reason that that the complaints are only published after the investigation and the findings have been come out. So like, I mean, I can just say I had an example where I heard a complaint, I don't know, maybe a year and a half ago about the police. I went and talked to the police officer about it and there was body camera footage. And so the complaint that I received, I then watched the body camera footage and mm -hmm. it was different than what the complaint said. And so like in that case, ha had we had a written procedure and had I been on the commission, I could have written my findings and said, you know, I watched this body camera footage with this officer on this date. And there, it was a conflicting, um, a conflicting right. issue here. So I think in that case, the investigation, like, and all we can really do is like trust the public body. This is why people have complaints about public safety commissions mm -hmm. and investigative mm -hmm. bodies. All we can do is trust the investigation process of this of the public safety commission to validate or mm -hmm. invalidate these the, these public complaints. So, um, and I think the PII is like a easy issue. Like I do think just having a checkbox that says, "Do you want?" like this is our po this is our policy every complaint is made public unless you say you do not want your complaint made public um could address that so we don't have to get anywhere yeah. right in terms of um changing language or voting or anything like that but mm -hmm. what i would recommend is that if there is recommendations you have we will bring this up at another meeting so definitely send them to me and the clerk, and we'll we'll add them um, in for discussion or, or edits. Right. You have two just, two folks in front of me. Sheila. Okay. I mean, um, if Ed wants to talk more about privacy uh, for people making complaints, I'll let him leapfrog me because I was going to change the topic slightly. Okay. Thank you, Sheila. I just wanted to say a couple things. Um, <clears throat> I know from my perspective of being the deputy fire chief at times I had to, I can't, I can't undo my video. So I'm sorry. I apologize about that. So I hope you can hear me. I can. Yeah. Okay. okay very good. Um, you know, there's a certain point where, where we, where we have to take stuff to, to HR, I mean, to get, to get their legal opinion on things and how to handle things and how to move forward. Um, I know when we did the police um, a little while ago, I think two meetings ago, right? Uh, Dave, was it two meetings ago? We went over their public complaint. I think it was two meetings ago, correct? We did. We didn't do the public complaint policy. We did the, um, 
uh, the vehicle. Um, Didn't we do they, post? They, we talked about post though. We did. We did. Yes. Yeah. We just kind of touched on it a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. they have a fairly uh, in depth um, policy on public complaints and they have to report their, their complaints to post. I mean, they can't. So I, I think this entitles a long discussion. Um, as far as being an investigator of complaints, I don't think there's, I, I can speak for myself. I don't think that I would be qualified to do. I mean, I could look into, I could get background stories from each party, but as far as coming up with a finding, I think that's way over, that would be way over any of our heads because there is all sorts of um, employees' rights, um, collective bargaining rights, um, HR. So, I mean, there's 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 a lot that it gets convoluted when uh, when you're talking about public official uh, uh, people servants. Um, um, so I I don't think that I I will I'll, I will come right out and say even as a deputy chief. I only carried it so far to find background and I left and, and I would leave, leave it up to the chief and the chief would probably most likely all the time go to HR um, because there's all sorts of privacy and there's all sorts of employee rights that, that could be. So I, I wouldn't feel comfortable coming, coming forward with any kind of recommendation. I could tell you what I found out, but as far as coming forward with a recommendation, as an investigator, I don't, I, I'm not an investigator. Um, I, you know, um, so I think this, this, this needs a lot of discussion and I think we need to include the chiefs or deputy chiefs from the departments who could, could answer. I, I know when we first started doing this policy, we had them invited to a and because I was actually part of that committee at that time when the first part went through. So, um, I'm glad that we're starting this. I, I believe there's a lot of work that needs to be done. As far as the public complaints on the webpage, shouldn't the, would that have to be an ordinance or couldn't that just be something the city could do citywide for any employee to put in a complaint and then the, then the mayor's office would vet it out to who met, to the appropriate people. I think, I think um, that way, I mean, I might have a complaint about, you know, the dog officer, who knows? <laughs> so. Um, so I, I think maybe that would be a, a way to for, for everybody to get involved in making complaints on the on the city webpage. I, I believe that this is going to take a lot of discussion on some of these um, changes. Right. Right. Yeah. But I think like Council Bullock was saying, is waiting for new members to get on the commission. And now it's the Public Safety Commission who's supposed to work together and work on some of this. And then you bring it back to A and O, but right now, you know, you guys could take a big chunk of this. I, I think um, I know, Sheila, that you want to speak. I'll just be brief. Um, the we have to take into consideration the complaint policies that the, all three departments have, because they do have complaint policies. And one of the things that the Public Safety Commission should do is make sure that they're following their internal policies. Um, then if we don't agree with everything that's in their policies, the Public Safety can Commission can review their policies and make recommendations to change their policies. But we really need to make sure the departments are following their policy. That, that's, the, that's what we can do. We can, we can do investigations too, but I'm just saying a, a key part of this is that we're making sure that if a complaint comes in to either department, they are following their process and procedure, and we check that they're following that process and procedure. So those are already in place. Like I said, the fire department never had one. They now have a complaint policy that they have to follow. It's very detailed. The police is extremely detailed. So those policies are the ones that we should make sure as commissioners, they are following if they get a complaint. Perfect. Thank you. So I'm actually really glad that I waited until after Ed spoke, because my question was going to be, you know, what kind of training do you have in place for people to conduct these investigations? And I started thinking about that, David, when you were talking about how you have a background in security, so you, you sort of understand this, but it sounds like there isn't any training in place. And I'm wondering if maybe that's um, a... a gap that we can close here because I feel like you know the public is going to sort of expect that 
if they're filing complaints that it's going to go to someone who's qualified to do an investigation. Um, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, that. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, if you're going to get a complaint and you're going to do an investigation, it's, it's a serious thing. Okay. People's lives, like, like commissioner said, as soon as you make a complaint, it's something that could tarnish their reputation. And plus the person that's making a complaint has a legitimate reason why. Mm -hmm. And you, you take it, it, it doesn't matter if the complaint is, you know, the fire person blew a, a bubble gum bubble in my face, or they cut me off and seriously injured me, right? Mm -hmm. You got to take every complaint seriously. So Sheila is right. You have to, we, we have to, I mean, I, I, we can, we have to do exactly what you said. We have to have a very solid official way to handle complaints. Mm -hmm. So if commissioner A gets assigned it and doesn't really understand it or needs help, mm -hmm. somebody like maybe like me or somebody or David Lenoy who has experience can guide them, mm -hmm. right? To make sure at the end of the day, when the results come back to the commission, we've done our job correctly and it's with confidence. Not, oh, because I think with past commissions, because they haven't had anything really in place, they kind of investigated the way they felt fit. Mm -hmm. Well, that might be good in some cases, but that doesn't build integrity and doesn't build confidence. So we really can, we should be able to go to anybody, the, the, the council, the public and say, this is how we investigate a complaint. It's very well documented. So that, I think that has to take place. We might need some outside training. It's quite possible that we, we, we should maybe get some outside training. Um, Cause I, I'm not gonna say that everything I do is correct. Maybe there are other ways too. I'm not, you know, I, I have experience, but it's not like, you know, I'm not an expert. So I think it's really important that we have that in place. So it sounds like, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. I do have one um, one comment about this uh, this document, this draft. If we are working on making changes, uh, we need to change page three, where it says um, the public safety members from among me their members serving such as such until until the compliant. The word says compliant instead of complaint. It's four times. So when we work on a document, we really need to be very careful about, you know, the word, the correct wording, the, the punctuation, mm -hmm. a legal binding, you know, form right. needs to be correct. Right. Yeah. And it's, right. okay. it's um, yeah, <laughs> it's, I know, I know it is a draft, but sometimes because, um, you know, spell check does not pick up the word that you, compliant versus complaint, you know, yeah. so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for catching it. And when it is due before it goes to the state. Okay. Yeah, Kathy, what happens is we when we put forward language, then Kathy and um Quinn do a good job of making sure that everything is written in legalese appropriately and spelled appropriately. This draft just came from Councillor 4G, and I don't even think it went to Kathy and them before. Um, for like a review yet because it's it's really just a discussion draft. Yeah, so no, it's, yeah. A good, it's a good start. And we yeah. also send it out to legal yeah. a lot so, of times so before it goes to the state. The, the issue right now for, for me is this is, I get this and this is my first day. So I, I have no idea where this is, whether it's a draft or whether, yeah. you know. So, but you um, didn't hear like the dark has already yeah. gone to the right. state. Right. Yeah. right. And the red yeah. is what we're the red is on right. So before you think you, it's all this stuff, remember it's a lot of this is already at the state level. Right. Yeah. Right. We did this a year or so ago. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it, like we're doing the right thing. We're upgrading. We're we're right. we're, we're reviewing and we're discussing and we're improving mm -hmm. our bylaws. That that's the point. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and it should be done. I, how, how often does Greenfield do it? Every five or ten years. I think it's, I, can, right? yeah, I mean, it, I think this is great because yep. you think, again, um, if we're going to make things better and we're going to build trust and we're going to have, um, uh, you know, things uh, out in the open, we have to build these to make sure not only doing things right, but yes, this is, you know, people are seeing that we're doing things right. 
Um, getting back to what the commissioner said on, on this part here about um, conducting, um, and it could be a word thing, but conducting em em the conduct of employees of those departments, including the department heads, chief. Um, I have a problem with the word jointly. <laughs> Um, that the, the, the Public Safety Commission and the Mayor's Office will jointly investigate. Um, I think uh, we have to talk about how the chiefs are investigated separate from anybody that's below the chief, right? Because the processes that they have in place, all the processes and the decisions run up to the chief. Right. And then the chief will come to the public safety commission and say, with this particular incident, this is what I would like to my what my, my result is. It's very different when the complaint comes in and it's about the chief. Right. So the public safety commission should be able to do their own independent investigation outside of the mayor. Right. right? right. So we can do things jointly, but we also should be doing things outside of the administration's uh, Right. You know, administration. So we could do our own investigation and come up with our own findings, not necessarily what the, this, the result of the penalty should be. That might be up to the chief or the mayor, but we should be able to do our own independent uh, investigation if a complaint comes in about the chief, because if a complaint comes in about the chief, he's kind of he or she are kind of stuck. Like, what do they do about it? Well, they can't have their own people investigate them. Right. So it has to be the, either the mayor or the Public Safety Commission. And it's not necessarily should be both together, maybe separated. I'm just bringing it up as a point. That's all. OK. Yeah. Catherine, did you have something? You yeah. Had yeah. So first, I just want to uh, say that I'm um, grateful for these different points that you're raising, one that I agree that with me, with uh, protecting people's safety and making their names public, that's a really important point. I'm grateful to you for thinking about it. And also that there needs to be uniform procedures um, and that you're giving this a lot of attention. I'm also grateful for that. Um, I'm, I would have like niggly little questions, but I, they're, they're, they're not like, I'm curious about the training. I'm curious, again, back to like, if the complaint doesn't go to the Public Safety Commission, how is it handled? But I overall hear you saying, there's a lot to be clarified here. Mm -hmm. And so I'm okay with that answer for right now. I guess my, my biggest question is, what is the timeline for you all now that you have a, a commission with new members and, and the, um, the people power to create these new procedures, what is the timeline for creating them? When could we expect to hear back from you all about what, because I'm very curious yeah. now that we're in this conversation, what these procedures will be. What What is the timeline that you're hoping for or anticipating with this? So I don't, I don't know if I can answer that. I, I think I'd have to, you know, we all would have to talk at our next meeting and bring it up to the chair, David Lanoy. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I think priority should be a written procedure for investigating, mm -hmm. right? And then get his take on it. He has a lot of experience um, in that area. And then maybe if it's, we decide, well, amongst ourselves, we can only go so far, we might ask for some outside help. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we might have to let the uh, a mayor know that we're looking for some outside help. There could be a cost to it. So we could maybe we let you know, uh, you know, at our next meeting, we could talk about it and decide, and then we could kind of look at the high level importance of it and then maybe come back after a few sessions and say, okay, well, this is where we think we are. This is where we want to go. And this is how much time it's going to take. I think it's going to be, you know, it's going to be, a, I think, a couple months, at least before we could really put, a, I mean, the city's never had a, an investigative process. Yeah. So not only do, can we create one, but who else has to look at it? Maybe the lawyers have to look at it. Mm -hmm. Maybe the administration has to look at it. Maybe the chiefs have to look at it. Right. But I think it, it's, a, it, it's pretty important. Yeah. So it might, this might be a three to six months <laughs> adventure. I don't, I can't, I don't know if I could answer your question. That's yeah. completely fair yeah. and to be expected. I, I guess I would just say I'm grateful for you trying to do, do yeah. your best to approach it and to, to you all 
for doing your best to approach it in as timely a manner as you can, because it is very important. I think if complaints come to us now, we can handle it. Um, and we will professionally. I mean, I know I will. I, I expect the other commissioners to handle it professionally mm -hmm. um, and to talk about it in executive session if we have to, if it involves personnel issues. I mean, I know how to, you know, I know when to call an executive session for an investigation and when not to. Mm -hmm. So I think we would handle it to the best of our capability right now until we do have this official document in hand. So when the commission changes or people move on, that written document is in place for folks mm -hmm. that don't have as much experience. Yeah, no, I I would hope that everyone would engage the complaint process in a professional manner, yeah. and that's up to up to you know individual. Uh, yeah. I don't know. So I really yeah. I appreciate you prioritizing creating a written. I don't know how it was done in the past, and I don't want to judge people in the past. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's no documentation on how an investigation happened three years ago or four years ago. I wouldn't be able to draw that information out from anybody. But moving forward, we can feel confident that if we have a packet, then we know, okay, well, it, this process should have been followed. Was it followed? Is, is my, yeah. what's important to me. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Good. Good. I think the, the piece that you said earlier, David, about like in order for there to be I can't remember the word you use, but like basically like in order for there to be integrity and people to feel mm -hmm. like is a sense of trust, like that that written process does have to be, has to exist, right? Which yeah. you're, you're like, we've never had, which is crazy to me that we've had a public safety commission, but there's no historical knowledge that's like, here's what our complaint investigation processes or complaint processes like that. And it's so it's really wonderful that we're at this juncture where that's starting to happen. Um, and just when I was doing some research back before the Public Safety Commission was was populated with functioning a functioning body, one of the things that was of note from other municipalities that have a Public Safety Commission that reviews complaints was that and I and the you know, I know Councillor Forgey having been a mayor and being very aware of collective bargaining process and, you know, laws and that sort of thing around what's possible that these, these steps around investigation and complaints process were intended to be followed within the parameters of HR policies, um, HIPAA, uh, you know, like all of those things that would be protected would still be protected within this process. So if you had a complaint, mm -hmm. like Commissioner Jarvis was saying that you had to go to HR with, like you would still go to HR with that complaint and you would still follow the protective mechanisms of, of HR. And if you needed a legal opinion, because that's what would just happen with this investigation, right? If it was of a sexual mis sexual misconduct or the type of thing that you would need to contact a legal entity for, that process would still be followed. Mm -hmm. This is yeah. still going for the process of like you said, like this, I mean, and not this triv this trivial either, but like the, you know, someone blew a bubble in my face or yeah, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what we, it sounds like, oh, sorry, Ed Jarvis, I see you have your hand up. Go for it. Oh, no, that's okay. I didn't uh, interrupt your thought. You were, you were moving along good. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to, wanted to say that that I think we, um, that, that we, like David said, we need to take our time, come up with a good, solid policy so we have confidence in both from the public and from the employees' perspective that that it wasn't something that we just rushed into and made a bunch of guidelines, you know, overnight. So I think, you know, I think, you know, as David said, it might take like six months before we come back with, with a rock solid policy because we kind of like vetted it out between everybody, including the counselors. And, and, you know, we definitely want everybody on board and feel like we're, we're, we're um, representing everybody fairly in this, in the, and the new policies moving forward, we don't want want anybody to feel like um, like it's a rushed deal, and that you know that it wasn't thought out and it wasn't done professionally with everybody's um, well being in mind. Okay, perfect. 
I mean, the other thing is, is that the, again, the fire department, police department, EMS can, without any consent from public safety, can go run their own investigation, right? They have that right to do that. And then post has their right to do whatever they do. So, I mean, we could get a complaint and not even know if post has it and they're doing something about it and maybe not necessarily know that the, well, I mean, we know if the police or fire department are addressing it because we can ask them, but I'm just saying, you know, there could be three entities doing an investigation about the same thing, maybe at the same time. So it gets a little convoluted, um, but we're concerned about the public safety commission is in the way they act. So we have, we have to have this, policy not only for now but for the future when you know we move on or whatever so it's rock solid and people are confident that okay you know no matter who the commissioners are they have this policy and they can follow it and if they follow it we're guaranteed to have you know an equal opportunity outcome of the, for the of the investigation mm -hmm. great perfect so I will, um, there was a couple concrete edits to this that were mentioned. I'll have those edits made and then we will invite you all back in a few months. We can just stay in touch about where you are at in terms of an investigation procedure, a complaint review of, um, of from the departments and um, potentially I have the other thing I have is to just make note to be in contact about language regarding the chief investigation of chiefs um, mm -hmm. and how you would want to reword that uh, to not to potentially be like independent investigation instead of jointly or whatever, um, whatever that language would be. So I'll make some of these edits and this is something we'll just keep on as a working document as as time goes on. Yeah, and I think, you know, and when we re-meet up again in a few months, we'll probably have a lot more clarity and information for you on what direction we're taking or some type of document that kind of outlines, you know, what we're looking at as far as steps on an investigation. I think that's quite possible. Great. Thank you all for your time. We really yeah, Thank you for inviting us. Thank I'm you. I'm glad that we're in a room together communicating. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, this is really good. I wish I was there instead of here, trust me. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, hi, Ed. Hi, Ed. <laughs> I will see you. <laughs> see you now, Ed. Okay. Um, so we're going to move on to dog bite okay. ordinances. Okay. We don't expect you all to stay unless you have strong thoughts on dog bites. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Um, I'm going to just be totally transparent. I'm fading. Um, so what I would love to do is bring up if any of you will just discuss this for a few minutes and then I have some concrete, there's two concrete things that are missing. Go for it, Sheila. The only concern that I see, um, is we talk about fines in here. I know there is a maximum fine that we can levy, and I'm not sure what that number is, but I think it's less than five hundred dollars. So we should look into that. Um, but we, other than that, I think this is reasonable, easy to follow, and like really just sort of codifying like this is what a responsible dog owner does. Yeah, the the fines in there were pulled from Montague. Um, so that's where those numbers came from. There's two pieces of this I haven't done. One is that I haven't talked to the police about this, who's one of the enforcers, and I haven't talked to animal control about this, who's another enforcer. And we would need to add in, um, we need to add in a section of where if a dog has violently attacked someone, that that dog may be quarantined um, at the owner's expense. And, um, and that is to me, especially there's like a piece around, like if they haven't produced a rabies certificate, if they haven't, I know this has happened <clears throat> locally recently that there has been dog bites and then they don't, they are not able to find the dog. And so they don't know if there's a rabies certificate. Um, so that's one of the pieces that like the police would be able to take the dog and quarantine the dog 
uh, and make sure that it's up to date on all of its shots and things like that. So I can make edits to this um, and I'll double check the fines um, in here, but does anyone have any thoughts on this? I, I'm raising my hand, but for some reason you can't see me. Yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> I don't know what exciting thing you were doing, Penny, that it's I don't know why that's happening, but you can hear me, right? Yeah, you hear? Okay. So honestly, I read this, I read this a couple of times before the meetings that we ended up canceling. And I wrote down questions and I didn't read it again before this meeting. So these questions feel slightly out of context, but maybe you'll know what I mean. Um, I mean, I understand them, but just wanted to name that. The two questions, what, well, three. One, I was wondering if you talk to the police or animal control. So thank you for naming that. I think you'll do that. Um, I think that some someone had talked about like naming them, naming the animals as canines versus dogs, and that might impact enforceability. I don't know, but I wanted to mention that. The two other questions were, what happens if someone doesn't pay a fine? Uh, and, and this might be more of a general question, but I was curious about that. And the other is, can people get a dangerous dog sign, even if their dog is not actually dangerous? Or is there a specific sign that only dangerous dog owners can get? I mean, I think anyone can get a dangerous dog sign. Okay. And put it, like, lots of people have song, signs that are just say, like, beware of dog. Yeah. Um, yeah. Keep people away from their property. Yeah. yeah. So anyone can get the dangerous dog sign. The way that I interpreted the dangerous dog sign was like, I mean, I don't know, maybe you don't have this. I have two dogs, but the, like the um, post office, like puts a little sticker on my mailbox with a note on it that like, has a picture of a dog. And then underneath it, it says electric fence. So they know that my dogs aren't just loose uh. and across the line went like to the mailbox they yeah it has a little sticker and it says electric fence so that if there's a new mail person they know that so my interpretation was that the the dangerous dog sign is used so that like people know that this is a dog that has been deemed dangerous by the city yeah um, and so um yeah so there's that one and then was was there another Are question there, what happens and this may be more of a general question just like what happens if a state law is preempting a a uh, municipal law, but what happens if someone doesn't pay a fine? If there's an ordinance with a fine and they don't pay it, does anyone know? Does it? Does it most of the time? Like if it bites someone, that person can sue, and it uh -huh. it goes after their mortgage. Yeah, I know. I know there's, two people. I mean, like, you, their mortgage got hit. That's why I'm not known for any of this because there's already stuff going on. Uh huh. You have a dog. I mean, you, when you have a homeowner, if, if you're a homeowner, you have your dog on your homeowner's insurance. So if someone was bit on your property, then um, the, the homeowner's insurance would cover the medical bills um, as long as you have that. I think mm -hmm. what we ran into and the reason this came up was because we've had some dog bites in Greenfield where they then either couldn't find the dog to find out if the dog had a rabies shot. So then the person had to go get a rabies shots and deal with all that. Um, and two, there was dogs that had multiple offenses that there had been, and there was no sort of like, there was no muzzling in public. There was no containment. Um, so this was trying to really address some of that piece but I will I can find out so that for our next meeting I can find out about the fines because I had that question too where I was like I like never want a fine to be a thing that spirals into yeah a bigger a bigger issue um but you mm -hmm. know I think that there is some expense to making sure that you are uh keeping a dog that might be potentially dangerous contained. Um, so, yeah. Great. So, so will we probably, will there, do you think you'll bring a motion to vote on this next meeting? Yeah, I'm gonna make, I'll make edits and send this out before next meeting and then we can bring it back to, um, to next month and we can actually vote on it then. Great. 
Okay. Does anyone have any other topics that need to be discussed under discussion? New business or old business? New business? Nope. Old business? I'm have to I'm gonna have to send something soon. Someone in my precinct uh sent me an email about e-bikes speeding on sidewalks. Mm. Um, it's not something I've been able to pay any attention to in the last couple of days, but um, just as a heads up. Okay. I have, um, I'll share that I'm researching an ordinance around remote meeting participation and the Human Rights Commission brought it up last at their last meeting. And I've uh, to hold myself accountable, basically, because it's been something I've wanted to work on for a while. I promised that I would reach out to Philippe and uh, and or Fernando to get the information about what that might look like for Greenfield um, in terms of what our current capabilities are. Um, so I am researching this and uh, I'm hoping to bring something forward relatively soon, but I Again, I can commit to you all that I'm going to try to have those that I'm going to have those conversations this month. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Sheila, just so you know, I know that there was some stuff passed about e-bikes in the transportation bond bill that passed. So you should check in there because there might already be like law that says e-bikes aren't allowed to be ridden on sidewalks or something. No, that's good to know. I haven't done any homework on it. I'm trying to just let you know it's a an issue that was raised with me and it deserves my attention. It just didn't get my attention like in the last two or three days since I got the email. That's all. Yeah, in that case, like if there is already law about it, then it's just like, what's the enforcement mechanism, which is always the problem with laws. Right. So. Okay, any other old business? Our next meeting will be October 11th, 2023 at 5.30. Uh, City Hall meeting room, second floor, and Zoom hybrid unless otherwise posted. And I hope to see you all next Wednesday in person, hopefully. Um, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved, Ricketts. Second. Great. Feel better. Yeah, Thank feel you. better. Meeting adjourned at 7.39 p.m. Thank you all.